So, assalamu alaikum, everyone, and good evening from this part of the world where we're situated. My name is Nadeem Suleiman, and welcome to our first webinar, MedChat webinar of 2023. So, a bit about the webinars. These webinars are held based on our book, MedChat, which was AKU's first ever digital book, and there are also print versions of the book available. The book is available on Amazon for World Over and at a platform called as Kobo for Pakistan. Uh, print versions are also available. So, um, the purpose of having these webinars is to have guests and start a conversation around ICE, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship and a chance for us to know more about our speaker's journey around ICE. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator for today's session, Professor and Chair of Emergency Department and Director CCIT, Dr. Asid Mia. Hi, Dr. Asid, good to have you here. Hi, Maureen. Thank you for the introduction. And our guest for today's session is um, an artist, Ms. Asma Khan, who is a Montreal-based visual artist from Pakistan. A bit about Asma, Asma draws inspiration from concepts of entropy, uh, superposition, and entanglement to draw on the human experience while creating landscape layered by microscopic light as a way to emulate self-similarity. Asma draws from the very smallest of life forms to represent larger systems such as time and space. Asma views the microscopic world as a third space that provides visual symbols for the unknown. Through her art, Asma also explores the complexities of human experience as alien, micro-realities of the inner time and space. An art exploration, uh, exploration into the nature of experiential time has been one of Asma's ongoing preoccupations. Interestingly, Currently, Asma is working on a two-year art exploration funded by the Canada Council of Arts and CalCU. Is that correct? Is it called yeah. CL? Mm -hmm. Her project, Micro Frequencies of Prayer, aims to reimagine and recreate the Muslim prayer rug by utilizing hidden landscapes of microscopic worlds. Uh, through collaboration with McGill and Concordia Labs, Asma is creating paintings from microscopic structures found in everyday things such as seeds, spices, coffee, tea, and water. This project not only addresses Islamophobia by inviting the viewer to conceive of these micro landscapes as the heart and intention of the one who prays for another, but also explores the feminine physicality of prayer rugs within the domesticity of Muslim homes, providing both refuge, travel, and fantasy once the unknown has been acknowledged as a space or entity. Welcome, Asma. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here. Good to have you here. Um, a bit about these webinars. So these webinars are meant to be interactive sessions. So for our guests who've joined online and people who are present with us at the T-Lab, um, if there's a question or you have comments or suggestions, please put them in the chat space provided, or you may just ask us and we'll address your question to Asma. Right, now with that, I would get started. So over to you, Dr. Asif, why don't you get us started with the questions? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you, Maureen. Actually, you've already got us started. So we're on our way, Asma. And um, so what we want to do somewhat differently this time, Asma, is that uh, rather than me, myself, and I just being the single moderator here and you being our guest speaker, um, Marine, as well as other people from the team that you have met when you were in Karachi, um, I think it was early in January, if I'm not mistaken. And in so, November. Oh my God, I'm like, okay, completely <laughs> disoriented to time, place, and person, and uh, the life of an emergency doctor. <laughs> Sorry. <Yes. laughs> I'm like, okay, it was January, though it's already end of January. So yeah, okay, fine. I stand corrected. It's been a few months then. Um, so yeah, so so we um, we we uh, have encouraged the team people who got to meet you, um, and they were inspired by you um, to actually just chime in. And we wanted to be even more conversational, and uh, we may not stick to the outline that we shared with you and the suggested questions. Okay, just to kind of like make it more fun and interactive. And um, uh, just repeating what Marin said that anybody who has um, uh, a comment or a question, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, you could put it in the chat box or you could um, ask um, in, if you're in the D lab. Um, I'm in the D zone, as you can see behind me, that's the psychedelic. I'm like somewhere, you know, psychedelia, you know, 
So Asma and uh, Asma can talk uh, talk to us about uh, psychedelics as well. Psychedel, sorry, psychedelics. Psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> and the link to art, and the link to uh, medicine as well. So, um, um, without further ado, um, Asma. So we shared um, chapters nine and 10, ten with you, and in in uh, in the past we've never shared two chapters with any individual. We've always had one chapter as a starting point, and we felt that both chapters nine and two were really appropriate. And so I will request you to tell our audience a bit about chapters nine and 10 versus me in describing the, uh, the, the ethos of those two chapters. And perhaps you, should, you could tell us a bit about the book as well, um, what Mad Jack is about and what you understand about it and how are chapters nine and 10 um, um, relevant to your work and why did we, why do you think we, um, asked you to delve into um, chapters nine and ten of Med Jack uh, as the starting point. And here's Med Jack. If people want to see, I guess this. Oh, look. There we go, Med Jack. That's Med Jack. Okay. Over to you, Asma. Um, I have to say, firstly, that I had it was a really brilliant read. The two chapters. Uh, it's simple to read, but I also. It connects, it's it's a very good read in how in interdisciplinary it is, because it's connecting the body, the mind, the spirit, consensus reality, realities that are not there that you want to create. So it delves between very many uh, ways of being, very many different kinds of systems, existing systems, and then systems that one creates. So uh, through, through through getting different kinds of disciplines together. So that's what I got out of uh, reading the, f the first two chapters. Also, the fact that medicine needs to become human based as opposed to, um, you know, like the, 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 the impetus on health, for example, is is not just health as you talk about it, it's larger systems that create, that generate systems of happiness. And in the West, we have uh, Maslow's, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which in, it, which in the Western context creates self-actualization self to be something that comes from capital gain. Because you have to, in Maslow's, a hierarchy of needs. You have to have achieved these things in consensus reality for you to be self-actualized. Where in the East, we don't, we have a different way of existing because we can't be self-actualized in the East. We are very poor to have the means that are that Maslow suggests. So, you know, and I think that's why this, this book is very important because the concept of jagar, as we spoke earlier, which is uh, which is such, which is I feel the magic of Pakistanis. Pakistanis, the magic in Pakistan is the is the is the system of jagar, that when you're told this is not possible, we don't have the funds, we're not able to do this, people somehow manage to to get together and create smaller new systems. So, um, so I think the book was giving through Eastern philosophies was giving more sort of, uh, and also the most, I, I feel that the most important point that you make in, uh, in the two chapters is that there's two systems. There's a system that we have absolutely no control of, which we understand as Pakistanis, electricity, gas, internet like there it's really obvious uh, and then the larger facets of our lives that we know we don't know who when someone's going to die etc cetera, etc cetera. we have no very little control so in the book i think it's very nice to like have that uh through stoicism have that differentiation between what is in our control and what is not in our control and try to concentrate on the few things that we can do within our consensus reality. And outside of consensus reality, that's where I'm very interested in. That's where art and creativity comes that 
you know, your circumstances can serve you something, but how you take those circumstances and what you create out of it is where art, creativity, and life comes in, your interaction with, with those, with consensus reality. So, um, so yeah, I really, I had a great time reading the chapters. Yeah. It was very inspiring, actually. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for those kind words, Asma. And so um, the book, for those who are un who are not really familiar, Medjack is, is a book about innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship based on our almost like decades experience of doing this through, not only through healthcare and health tech innovation, but also non-healthcare areas such as arts and humanities and social sciences, social innovation, social entrepreneurship. And so the two chapters that Asma you know, was talking about Chapter nine, uh, the title is Create to Innovate. And chapter 10's title is Innovation for Life. And so, and so it's it's uh, it's such a it's um it's such a privilege, I would say, Asma, to hear about uh the uh, interpretation of chapters nine and ten from you, because um, you know, once as a, as a, as the writer of those two chapters, and and people have to keep in mind that the book is a is a, is a team approach. There are 14 co-authors, but those two chapters um, were some uh, were chapters that I kind of delved into because I um, um, I'm intrigued by the by the by the interdisciplinarity of innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. And it doesn't matter what profession you belong to, um, you can be anybody or anyone, and from whatever discipline, and you can uh, play in innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. So it's interdisciplinary from that perspective. And so, and so, you know, when I, while I was um, uh, ideating about that particular chapter or those two chapters, and while I was writing those chapters, and even after uh, the, the the finished product as the chapters in the book, um, my take on it was uh, was my take on it, right? So I did not send out those chapters for external peer review or external review and then get feedback. I just put them together and put them in as part of the book. And so now hearing from you as Somebody who's an artist who's delving uh, entirely into uh, into the um, visual space or art space or or however way you want to define it, um, to 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 uh, get that kind of validation uh, from a person who has nothing to do with healthcare to you know um, uh, appreciate the content and and to find it meaningful. I think so. Uh, I guess I'm kind of rambling as well. Thank you. <laughs> it's the bottom meaning, line of, uh, It's well. meaningful, <laughs> and I think what's also interesting is that you create inclusion in it. As an mm. artist, I was like, mm, what do I have to do with healthcare? But reading that, reading the two chapters, I understand my position with healthcare or my involvement possibly in the future with it. So, and that is super, see, these two chapters are very important also because now here, for example, in Canada, uh, while speaking with friends, artists, scholars, philosophers, institutions, what's becoming more prevalent is that the only way to deal with the complex nature of our reality, climate change, uh medicine advancements ai everything the only way to deal with it is to move away from well we are specialized but to also despecialize in order to create a third space where we are we are very intra we are very inter we are very intra disciplinary that is so important and that's why like things like emergent science emergent botany emergent biology, cellular structures, I mean, cellular knowledge, for example, that is becoming very important that how do we, for example, someone gets to understand something, a scientist can understand something about uh, physics, about quantum physics by understanding the structure of certain of the spinal cord. That, that sort of relation, that kind of rela relations, is, it's so important and so interesting. So I think it's it's time to connect, connect, connect all disciplines because they got disconnected through specializations in the last God knows how many years. 
That's a that's an excellent point, and um, um, it's really nice how you've kind of very organically kind of segued into that particular point, which we want um, uh, to make um, and and reinforce through these webinars. Um, as CCIT, we, we we strongly believe that the decentralization process, after being super specialized, um, has become exceedingly important. So from going from a specialist to a generalist, um, so that you kind of zoom out and start looking at things um, through a zoomed out uh, lens versus being uh, too um, focused on the nitty gritty, uh, which has its own potential and it's ha it has its own advantages. But I think with the, you know, you, you said com the complex nature of a reality, I think you can't be super specialized with the complex nature of a reality because when you zoom out, you start seeing patterns. Patterns actually emerge and maybe, exactly. maybe we're giving it so maybe maybe we're creating meaning and maybe the patterns aren't, you know, we, we kind of connect the dots, whatever way we want to connect them. Um, and uh, and if it if it makes sense to us and gives us meaning, then why not? Right. And so yeah. that's where emergent biology or emergent botany, emergent zoology, emergent cell biology. I think those are such amazingly cool thoughts and uh, perspectives as well, because I didn't realize it as such. Um, uh, I, I've studied cell biology and molecular biology, but I have not kept up with all of that. And now that you're mentioning it as an emergent field, maybe things are happening that um, we I would have uh, probably I would have thought that um, things are static and things don't change, but things are changing perhaps. And and uh, so it's really um, exciting. Do, do you want to delve into? Changing. Yeah, things, things are changing, and also I think. For, there's two interesting things that are happening. There's this uh, brilliant professor that I, I think I'd mentioned the last time as well, Dr. Huberman, who's a, who's a neurobiologist at Princeton. So he, he said in his talk a few weeks ago that 50% of medical textbooks that are written are, are not accurate. 50% of the information in all medical textbooks is not accurate because we're not sure. We don't know whether this phenomena, even though it happened five, six times, if that's because there's so many anomalies that we are seeing. What we think are anomalies now could actually be larger principles. So it's it's really interesting um, that we are basing knowledge, we are basing facts on something that that we don't know for sure. So I think it's really important to concentrate sometimes, at least for me as an artist, my way of operating is to con to have a quick look at what we don't know, which is essentially everything. If we look at how much we know, we know there's about 2% of botany, there's about 2% of geology that we know, there's 2% of the ocean floor that we know, there's maybe 0.001% of the cosmos that we know, there's uh, just the spinal cord, there's only that much we know, how certain things are uh, anomalies in, in the body or in larger, in larger systems, the system of gravity, why gravity is weak, that is an anomaly, we don't know why. So there is so much that we don't know that it liberates you almost from a lot because we live, our consensus reality focuses around what we know and we make it into such a thing. It's such a thing, oh, we know this and this and this and it's such a drama of knowledge. I really like in the chapters also how there's a distinction, you create a distinction between data, wisdom, knowledge. And I think that's a very important distinction. Data is important. Data is absolute, for me as an artist, data is absolutely crucial because it helps me navigate what I don't know. And data is important because we know in nature there's self-similarity, there's biomimicry. If I know that like, for example, I'm looking at a cumin seed under the microscope at a very, very high level of magnification. And the more deeper you go into the cumin seed, 
or a coriander seed under an electron microscope, the details get crazier the more deep the, the deeper you go to a point where your brain starts to like there's a point where I have to stop looking because you are overwhelmed by data incredible data and and so my way of understanding the unknown is that if I can content if I can look at data of what is hidden from the from the eye like microscopic structures are hidden we don't see them we don't know them so if we can look at details of what is hidden then it helps me to intuit or to intuitively third space and create something that i hope is correct from the unseen world seeing something hidden helps me draw what is not there what i can't see so, um, for example, this particular project, as you mentioned, I'm creating prayer rugs, um, which is firstly a, a, a big project. Um, it's also a big project because I'm someone who's prayed all my life. You know, I've been praying since I was 10 years old. So it's for me, it's it's a family, a, a prayer rug, the the the, the relation. The relationship with the prayer rug is just like if you've known something since you were 10 years old, it's your cousin, it's your family, it's your brother, it's your sister. It's diff because there's such proximity uh, in time and space. So I want to, and, and as we know, there is Islamophobia in Canada and the whole world and it's growing. So th there's so many criticisms about prayer, like I know that here, for example, in the in North America, it, it's you you can't really talk about the deities. You can't talk like I'm not using the word God on uh, because you 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 don't talk about this is not a culture where you talk about that sort of stuff. And so you have to come through this way. You have to come. So I'm trying to come. I'm not I'm not holding my ear like this. I'm trying to hold my ear like this in order to talk about the unknown, the largeness of uh, whoever created this uh, universe through through the experience of having prayed. And um, you get, we get a lot of criticism here that, oh, what is prayer and why? And why do you bother? Like, what is the use of prayer? It's such a... It's such a word, it's such an empty word, you know, like I, I I read stuff like that. So I think this project is really to to also share how beautiful it is when someone stops what they're doing uh, and they create this time space structure where they sit and actively wish someone well. You sit and 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 that landscape, what is that landscape in time, space? I'm very interested in creating, in capturing instances in time, space, reality, which which pulls you out of consensus reality, which is like, you know, consensus reality is, the, is how we think things are going. But true reality is something else. True reality is truly the investigation of nature that we don't know. True reality is acknowledging that we know nothing, that we are, we are in the 1% of knowledge. That's true reality, at least. So I think that um, in that space, creating a time space uh, structure by looking at molecular forms, to create a space where you can show the intention of prayer and 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 how it help, allows you to travel like i know that you know as a pakistani living in the in the west long it's been i've been now longer in the west than i've been in pakistan but my connection to pakistan stays fresh on my janamas when i'm on the janamas my family is around, my, th those who passed away, I can, you know, like there's proximity between life and death as well. Like there is such space that, that the prayer rug holds for both the one who's praying and then the one that they're praying for. 
and the system that they pray to. Like, this is also, I feel like the biggest romance of prayer. It's, I find prayer positively ro romantic. The biz biggest romance of prayer is to the acknowledgement, to, to, to say hello out there to the large unknown and to say, I know you're there. I don't know you. You're, but, but that start, just starting that hello, I feel it's such a, it's such a special thing that it, it should be captured on canvas. Wow. Uh, so uh, I'm mesmerized. And, you know, I, like while you're talking about all of these things, uh, it's almost like one starts getting goosebumps, right? Because the way you describe it, it's just fascinating. And 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 you're able to kind of um, put this all together. It's just, um, um, yeah, I don't know how to kind of like how to explain that. But but it's it's such a uh, it's such an inspiration as well. Right. So Asma, I think you're blessed that you have the articulation and you have the ability to connect all of these things. Um, I think sadly, a lot of us kind of pass through life um, and we so focused on our own disciplines and we don't realize that um, we don't know pretty much most things around. We really don't yes. understand, right? But we become experts. And so I think medicine and healthcare is uh, such a prime example of that. Um, it's arrogance at times and it's like, oh, we know it and I know it. Or, um, and so... But the humility um, that you kind of um, project by uh, connecting uh, uh, the what you're seeing at the microscopic level, electron microscopic level, and and then you've got to pull yourself out of that as well because it becomes overwhelming. And so yes. I can I can I can imagine I I think I, I can I can kind of that resonates with me that you know you you at some point one has to kind of like disconnect from all of that and so intense and, so much intensity. and it's also it's a very strange thing um there is beauty too much beauty is dangerous mm. that's the only way i can say it there is such incredible de beauty in the microscopic world that you feel paralyzed after a while. And then you, and then as an artist, you're like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. How am I supposed to do anything out of this? Because this is the ultimate. So you're looking at ultimate beauty and then you have to, as a, as a mere, mere human, have to create something. But I just want to say one other thing that pertains to, this, to, the, to chapter two. Um, that was very important for me, which is that uh, when you talk about happiness outside of Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, uh, happiness in all its different forms, and um, and then, you know, happiness as we perceive it in the West, the ideals of happiness in the West, in the East, like there are all these different things. Um, but at the same time, what is the way to eliminate unhappiness, to create happiness? And in my experience, I feel like uh, I can say that as an artist, that art comes essentially from dealing with unhappiness and finding pockets in your life where you can, if you're going to suffer over something, for example, your loved one dies, your loved one dies, you know, you, you know, you're going to be suffering for about one to two years, a lot of my loved ones have died. So I know that that's the span it will take for you to grieve, we will all go through death, we will all go through suffering. And that's normal. It's it's an investment of time and space. Grief is an investment that you're not you're not allowed to move from a certain place, it holds you down. When he, grief holds you down, for example, to, if you can create something out of your grief, either in poetry, in beauty, in kindness, in good acts, as you know, as we know from Pakistan. Uh, but if we can create something out of our grief, then our grief becomes a curiosity. And curiosity helps you move beautifully. So if I... I, for example, I was in grief 
a lot a lot of my relatives died during covid i was stuck here i couldn't go to pakistan to see my loved ones so that grief got me into quantum physics it got me into i feel like science can really the knowledge of science the 2% that we do know the 1. Point or 0.1% that we do know is so intrinsically beautiful it's so intrinsically absurd compared to how we think the world is it's nothing like what we think if you really start to look at physics if you start to look at you know any science if you go deep into like you have you guys are doctors you have studied 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 and you have vast knowledges of organs and the beauty of the liver and the kidney and um to concentrate on what is known is a beautiful way to create your curiosity out of unhappiness. Science can actually, like science, the knowledge of nature helps us move into from one space to another, helps us create. So I think that is a very, very important thing. And, and I have to say, like, the art that gets done in Pakistan, because Pakistan, it's it's very interesting. Canada is a, you know, everybody is very safe in Canada. And the kind of art that comes out of safety is very different than the kind of art that comes from someone who just heard a clash and cough, who, who, know, who, who knows that, oh my God, some murders were committed in the city. Or, you know, like Karachi has a sense of, Anything can happen at any point. The art that gets made in that space is so potent. Like I, every time I come to Pakistan, I'm blown away by the kind of art that's getting made in Pakistan because it's coming from a real place. It's not coming from a safe, safe, safe place. So I think that um, when we talk about happiness and what are the different kinds of happiness you know, forms of happiness. It is also important that to, to acknowledge that creativity helps you unload ha unhappiness. That's, that's, um, that's amazing. So creativity helps us unload um, unhappiness, mm -hmm. right? Hmm. Amazing. So, um, as, uh, okay, so for the people out there who are listening, if you have comments or questions, uh, please uh, feel free to um, chime in. Um, Asma, would you be able to show us some of your artwork? Yes, uh, absolutely. Do, do you want to share your screen or uh, how do you want to do this? We have some backup images here as well. If I try to, uh, actually, maybe we could use... I could show what I have here right now without sharing my screen because I'll mess it up. I'm very yeah, bad. Sure, sure. But yeah, I'll cool. show you my some of the things that I've been doing uh, in the last little while. And then perhaps you could share your screen and we could look at some of the work that you have of mine. Um, so one series that I've been doing that I that we spoke about in the last session was that I am very interested in grasping the nature of time. So uh, I've been making different kinds of clocks and, and I'm interested in time from a very micrological point of view because I look at the smallest, the smallest, the smallest. So if you were to break down time into instances, for example, the instance, the instance of prayer, that's a good example. If you're really having a good prayer, one moment on your prayer rug, could, could stretch and time changes, the nature of time changes. When you're in grief, time is different. When you're happy, time is different. When you're jealous, time is different. When you're hungry, time is different. So time is constantly, it's an entity that is not fully understood. Like even Einstein, he, he, he kept repeating, he's just like, gosh, we don't really know what time is. Like what exactly is time? So I'm interested in looking at the experiential nature of time, which is very much 
which is similar to how time is ex explained in quantum physics, which is that time is uh, non-linear, it flows backwards and forwards. So I'm trying to create these clocks um, where these, these um, they're, they're incomplete, but there's a lot of detail that look like sort of landscapes. And then um, these clocks of experiential time using intuition and different forms of, um, yeah, looking at different kinds of landscapes. And then some of these, uh, then some of these clocks became more, um, you know, like, then I started to do triangular clocks where there, a small part of the clock shows up, but then I start to get birds in there because time as, as, an, as an indication of what happens to time, the nature of time when it's passing through beauty. What is the time inside a rose? What is the time inside a lemon? I drew a lemon clock, which is, you know, so time, not from our perspective, time from this perspective of a bird, time from the perspective of a song, time, so this is time, um, this, this I'm making time that is going through water. So it's just these linear long kinds of canvases where I'm imagining that time is passing through a body of water and uh, how does that change time? So it's just these different um, sorts of, sometimes I imagine like, what is the time in my elbow? What's the time in my knee? And I want to go deep inside the, then I want to draw the elbow. I look at the ligaments of the elbow, the muscles of the elbow, the anatomy of the elbow, and you draw it. And by drawing it more and more and more, we, I can intuit into something that, that to me looks like a clock. <laughs> So, um, and then if you can see behind me, uh, okay, this is kind of far away, but this is the first prayer rug here that is being made. And this prayer rug is, um, it's the microscopic view of the crack of an eggshell inside. So an egg and then the crack in the eggshell is, um, I'm creating a, so so all the prayer rugs will be created from tiny details. So this is a crack in an egg and I, and it's turning into a bird in by itself. You know, when you draw it, you draw it, you draw it. So it's just like, okay, I started with the crack, uh, the crack of an egg and it's turning slowly by itself into a bird. So that's, you know, that's the third space element that is absolutely important in art which you allow where you which is the which is the element of I don't know myself as the artist what the art form will be it's a it's a process of exploration uh, that's uh, fascinating um, your uh, deep dive into uh, artistic dive into time is uh, is just amazing um, I, I think uh, just we, we could kind of just um, encourage people to put more uh, questions there. But uh, Harun is saying, you speak so well, Asma, you put things the way it's easiest to imagine and relate to and internalize. Oh, um, thank, thank you. you for that. Um, so just, uh, just a bit uh, more about time, um, because you have this fascination for time and I have a fascination for time through the written word. So I don't... Uh, create art forms or artwork, but I think um, I've, I've been fascinated by time. I've written about time through poetry and prose. I'm not a poet, um, but uh, I think the, uh, the mystery of time is such that um, just writing about it through prose uh, does a disservice. So uh, for a non-poet to create Verses around time, I think uh, it ju it's just uh, uh, it's something to be said about time. So um, I think poetry uh, is a very good vessel for time to capture time in its nature because poetry can catch the absurd before 
before longer writing, like prose can catch it. Because you have to catch something very quickly. And poetry has the capacity, to, which you've got, I feel. Well, thank you. <laughs> Shaire Mashrik. <laughs> uh, and you're the uh acha, okay, so there are two more comments here so Hebe is saying i never could imagine um uh, i never imagined someone could explain time in such a fascinating way wow very impressive and thank you for showing the best that can be thought about time thank, thank you, you for that and arun is saying has anyone read the 11 dimensions of time it's written by an indian author i don't remember his name Oh my um, God, I haven't read the book, but I am very, very interested. And I've been studying the 11 dimensions of time uh, through a few other scientists uh, who talk about it in quantum physics. And um, and I'm absolutely, that that is my main inspiration, the 11 dimensions of time. So yeah, I'm totally into that. And, and you know, it's... it's um... Time, um, or the um, uh, the perception of time, or the uh, gauging time, um, there's a scientific basis to that. Mo uh, cells are able to somehow, right, uh, um, gauge, or, or uh, obviously plants and animals are able to gauge, and so there's and there are humans have circadian rhythms, and so um, that's such a mystery as well. And they, but it's been known that their genes and they and their uh, proteins as well that uh, are all time dependent and so how is this happening at a at a molecular level it's just fascinating Revati Revati is saying there's a lot of ancient literature on time and that's true it's true and also it's fascinating that isn't it true that all the that there's an inner clock for every organ in our body as to when it will die and they're all not dying at the same time we're all like liver, kidney, they're all mm. sort of going to go at yeah. different times. Their clocks are different. And Their clocks uh, are different, yeah. And also yeah. Uh, there's this, this other, I don't know how scientific it is, but I think this is uh, more sort of Chinese medicine where you look at where the gallbladder has a different frequency, like these, these this is more waves and frequency that all... Uh, all organs work at different frequencies and so to look at my project with the uh, with the prayer rugs is called micro frequencies of prayer because it is also to capture these micro frequencies that happen in our body when we're in a state of prayer where we're in a state of grace or when we are in a state it's something to I, I do think that it's very important and it's a it's an incredibly important thing a human does when they acknowledge something they cannot see with great confidence the way the way a prayer rug invites you like and especially I think it becomes more and more important and fascinating when you live in the West because it's such a different system here it's such a different way of being here so then uh, the 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 fascination with the prayer rug and its state the state that a prayer rug invokes um you know is much more potent for me in canada in pakistan i'd be like oh janamas whatever <laughs> you know because you're it's like so um you know what is up now in canada dal is the ultimate if i get to eat dal it's like wow <laughs> So, um, yeah. So, um, okay, two more comments. Harun is saying, please invite Asma for a follow-up session. Um, I could not um, complete the session, but this is so inspiring. Thank you, Asma. Thank and, you. Uh, we might um, call upon Asma um, later this year for a workshop or something um, through the D-Lab, right? So we'll think about how um, we could take this conversation to the next level, which would include some kind of interactive, hands-on based kind of exercise as well. And we can well, I'll be that. in town. I'll be in town. I'll be in Karachi by the end of this year. So we could probably do something in person. Okay. Yeah, okay, that'd so we be have great. A... Sorry, hmm. but we do have Very a question good. here. Why don't you uh, tell us your name and then you can just ask the question. Uh, mm -hmm. the camera to you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm Wajiha and... Uh, this is really fascinating because 
I have very much connection with the time. It sometimes it gets me worried. And uh, so my question is, <clears throat> why there is less time but more knowledge? Like, aren't we supposed to, uh, like, as you said, we know only 2% of things. So we have, like, we uh, live 60 or 70 years, and we couldn't know anything until then. And uh, I think that when we, uh, when we say we don't know anything, we start to read, like, upon a lot, and we limit our imaginations. So... I think we need to take more time for ourselves. What would you say? Um, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, I, I think we need to take more time for ourselves. And I think that the nature of time will change if you think that you know everything because then your responsibilities with with everything that you're connected to changes because you think you know everything and you figured it out. As opposed to if you are truly a student of time and truly a student of nature and reality, then time is very kind on you. This is, this is uh, like if, for example, we know that when we sit and contemplate, you know, when you go to the mountains, you start walking on the mountain. At some point, you and your mountain are the one, are one. There's no difference between you and the mountain. That means you've effectively stopped time by being one with the mountain. So I feel like the more we explore the nature of reality from the point of not knowing, as opposed to there's two ways of knowing. I can I can know something, but my background is that I already know it. Then I know it a different way and then time changes. But if I start with the premise that, wow, I really don't know anything and it's time to explore, then I feel and I and I if I become a true student of real of, of nature, then time will slow down for me. That's at least my experience. Time slows down if you want to become its student, if you acknowledge it, and if you work with it. Great, thank you. Yeah, That's thank you. very well said. So do we have any other questions? Okay, so Harun's saying he's going to start appreciating the prayer rug from now on, and I do agree. <laughs> The whole concept of Turkey I'm Mugi. I'm so and... happy. <laughs> I'm really happy. Yeah. Uh, also, if you want to show some of the work, uh, if there's no questions, we could also sh uh, show some of the work. And unless you have other something else, I, I um I I do have a question. If it's okay, yeah. mm -hmm. awesome. Um. Because yeah, we'd love to uh, love, love for people to see um your artwork as well, but um um. So, so one question is about uh, what you call the third space, and um, you've mentioned the third space, and um, and I know when you were in Karachi, we had a conversation about third space, about the third space, and and what is the third space, um, and uh, how do you define third space, and why is it of interest to you? Uh, third space is of great interest to me and I work with it all the time is because, because I am drawing something that is, I'm not making a still life where I can look at the shape of the jug or the apple and, and, and if I'm drawing about gravity, where do I start? Because gravity, there's no, there's no, there's diagrams and there's formulas on gravity, but from a visual artist's point of view, how do I draw gravity or the weakness of it and why it's weak, something we don't even know. So that's why I need third space because, because what I do know is I do, I've seen enough, like I've been drawing now for 20, 25, 30 years that I know about self-similarity, that when I'm drawing a crustacean, uh, a shell, um, a molecular structure, a kidney, um, give me anything in nature that I'm drawing, 
ultimately there is a commonality that everything becomes connected through its design. So we know about self-similarity. We know that the very smallest in nature also emulates the largest in nature. When we look at the nebula, when we look at uh, large space structures, they could look like a form inside your heart. They could look like in something inside a blood clot, for example. So there's self self similarity in nature. So by third space, third space allows me to intuit, to start the process of uh, start the process of intuition, so I can get into drawing gravity. So and third space generally happens by itself. I don't choose it. Like I'd start drawing. If I'm drawing an elbow, for example, and if I'm trying to find the time of the elbow, for example, what is the clock inside this? Then somehow a bird will appear into my drawing. I didn't plan on the bird being there. And then I'll, I'll be like, oh, that's a bird. I'm going to look at the microscopic view of a feather now. So I start to look at the microscopic view of the feather. And I'm third spacing from the, and then that goes in. The, and then something else from the bird arises. And I look at the microscopic structure of that. And then that goes into the drawing. So third spacing is like drawing the thread in the needle. And, and the thread is unknown. You don't know what it is. You have the needle, which is your pencil. And then you draw an unknown thread and you just get into it and things emerge. I think that when we talk about emergent sciences, the word emergent is so important because in any practice, if you've done it long enough, and if you acknowledge the unknown, you'll into it, into it. So, um, yeah. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. And I think uh, we definitely would love to have you in the future to talk more about some of these things. And so Harun, as a question, Harun, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Asma. Uh, you know, from your talk, what I gathered was, you know, that you, you know, you managed to, you know, actually take out time from life, you know, and think about the things which we don't normally think about, right? Uh, you know, we are so much focused on a daily life, right? And uh, it's, you know, it's it gets very, you know, you get lost in things, you know, that you miss out, you know, on the magnificence of life, right? I mean, the things which you don't think think about, you know, and I was just reading somewhere, I know, very recently that uh, there was a there was a web article on how it looks exactly like, you know, uh, a picture of galaxies, right? So there are, you know, when you, when you really zoom out, you know, on the cosmos, right? You see a network of galaxy, you know, which resemble brain cells. Totally. I know, you know that is the same thing, right? Then you start to pattern, like, you know, when you see the structure of an atom, right? And with the electron, you know, going, going around, right? It is exactly the same pattern as you look at the solar system, right? I mean, planets going around the sun, right? I mean, and you see this repetition, right? You see the same patterns, you know. And uh, I, you know, at the risk of you know turning this conversation into a very religious one, you know, there is a verse in the Quran which says, you know, that uh, you will not see any change in God's ways, right? So, I mean, linking it with them, right? I mean, you know, there is a constant pattern which you see, you know, everywhere, you know, and across scale, right? Right from the minutest thing you know, to the grandest, right? So, I mean, for, I know sometimes, you know, that, you know, makes me off, you know, like we are missing out on things, right? I mean, we are so much focused, you know, on, you know, the traditional, you know, obligations of faith, right? I mean, bas namas you know, just make it a ritual, you know, and just give zakat, you know, and just, you know, just, give zakat, you know and just make things into ritual, you know, and you forget why are we doing this, right? And for yes. whom are we doing this, right? And who that, you know, that being is actually capable of, right? I so completely I agree. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, yeah. because of that, Harun, uh, you know, like in Pakistan, the prayer rug was just a prayer rug. 
एंड जब छुप छुप के नमाज पढ़नी पड़ती है तो फिर नमाज बहुत मीठी हो जाती है यू नो लाइक यहाँ पे तो छुप छुप के पढ़नी पड़ती है एंड देन फिर एंड दैट इज अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग व्हेन थिंग्स गो हिडन व्हेन थिंग्स बिकम हिडन और थिंग्स और यू आर फोर्स टू हाइड समथिंग इट्स इट्स नेचर चेंजेस राइट and and i think that that is also very very interesting because when you look at physics and you look at wave function things have to be hidden wave function is basically potentiality and things have to be completely hidden for something to change form um i'm very interested in what's hidden and why we hide certain things and maybe there's some things that we should hide in order for them to become fresh again or to become new again you know like for example in pakistan my my relationship was with prayer was different but now here it's different because i've changed space and now the prayer rug becomes something else for me because it's it it was hidden it's become hidden now so if we could in pakistan create like a le- little secret relationship with our prayer rug as you know as the the flying carpet that we get on to acknowledge what truly we don't know and to really really think about the nature of reality because god is reality what is its nature we don't know we know so little but one you know i i think it's nice the the, the state of prayer is a great state to contemplate the unknown from everything we know and it becomes so much more interesting exactly thank you so much asma thank you thank mm-hmm. you we have two more questions there uh, let uh, let's start off with ali jafrani so um So okay so Ali saying thank you for such an inspirational talk uh, can you please share your journey of how you started doing what you do and seeing things from this perspective That's such a great question thank you um I I started doing what I did because I was really bad at everything else I failed school throughout I was I wanted to get it good into science failed science failed math failed everything the only thing I did <laughs> so it was a process of elimination for me <laughs> i could just i was good at art and then i went to indus valley school uh in pakistan uh while i was still there and then right after that i left um and then you know right after indus i was living in many countries i was in europe for many years and then 20 years 25 years ago i moved to canada so my life was essentially very like going from one country to another one system to another not not knowing very much so the only thread that i had in my life was prayer and drawing that was the only thing that was connecting me from place to place to place otherwise my experiences were different every country was different so eventually now after a 30 year practice art practice um of through a process of elimination because circumstances also no i wanted to become this it didn't work out oh i wanted to become a designer it didn't work out so it was just art 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 so after 30 years it becomes a significant something in your life like for me art is my family it shows up for me when i'm sad i know exactly where to put my sadness if i'm too happy i know where to put bright colors on canvas like i i communicate on canvas uh everything that you know that occurs so that's also a big third space like it's not just the microscope that i microscopic life that you draw you also draw your daily life experiences all your daily because i have a practice where i draw 8 hours a day you know 7 days a week so i'm really really seriously uh committed to art and 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 understanding the nature of reality through art so um so yeah like you know if you if you do it for for long enough then uh 
it's it's a good tool for you to have now drawing for me is very easy and i'm very happy that uh, that i can now into it because i'm comfortable with drawing i do feel like going back to you know chapter 2 about happiness is if you can take a skill and hone it and hone it and hone it your entire life it's the same thing if you can have a relationship with your prayer rug after 30 years of praying it's a very special prayer rug you know there's a it's like your other mother it's like your family it's like uh so and so is art i think you'd give anything enough time it becomes yours i hope That's that answers um Ali, the, the, was your question answered? You could put it in the chat box if you want. Uh, just, just to kind of like um, uh, connect what you're saying um, to, um, you know, when you talk about um, uh, being in the zone, it's kind of like, I don't know, you didn't say that you're in the zone when you create or when you're doing your artwork, but Taoism delves into that, uh, being like water perhaps, or like, when you're creating, then you're in the zone. Um, and things kind of just happen organically almost. And um, when you talk about the third space and intuition or intuiting, uh, it's almost similar to my understanding of what that is perhaps as well, being in the zone. Um, well, so I think into, hmm. one thing I'd like to say about the zone, there's a lot of impetus on the zone, for example, in the West as well. And there's a lot of neuroscience now trying to figure out like, how oh, is there a way, is there a shortcut to get into the zone? But I do think honestly that I was obsessed about being in the zone and like figuring out like, what is it that gets me in the zone? What is that combo that gets me in the zone? And I, and after that many years, I feel like if you, art or any other form of practice is I'm in the old school way of 99% perspiration. And if the deity decides to visit you in your studio once a month, great. But if they don't, it doesn't, you have to put in the 99%. So now I, I used to, I got really too involved with like, oh, I'm not in the zone. That means I'm not drawing well because you can't always be in the zone. You have to pay your bills. Someone's knocking on your door. Na 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 na. Reality is happening, so you can't always be inspired, but you can be attempting to be inspired by the ninety nine percent of your practice. So I make sure that I practice every day, and if the angel of inspiration decides once a month to visit, great. Sometimes they are more generous with their visits and sometimes they don't come at all. And, um, but you just got to do what you're doing. Because the zone is one thing and there is an, there is, there is an, an intuition that resides in the body, that resides in the hand that has drawn a lot, that resides in your inner systems that you don't know about. So, um, you know. Makes sense. Um, so Asma, you know, the session will be ending soon and we've had so much fun talking to you. We would love to get you into another uh, webinar soon and or a workshop. If you could give one take home message for our viewers and listeners and people who are present here. One message, okay. This is this is this may sound trite, um, but I I've been living away from Pakistan now twenty two years or twenty three years, and uh, I was just in Pakistan, and you're in Pakistan right now. So I just want to say that, you know, I look at I look at the talent and the the incredible vast levels of beingness that exists in Pakistan because of, you know, when you were talking about gross national happiness in your chapter two or chapter one, 
And then it was really inspiring. To, like Pakistan is a country, I think that, okay, we have such little, we don't have a lot, but we are the highest in, in terms of giving zakat, in, in, in terms of giving charity to the poor, we are one of the highest. And the potential in Pakistan is so huge because we have jugar, we have creativity, and then we have a tradition that we can fall back upon. Um, that I think that uh, I look at the artwork that's being made in Pakistan. I look at the, the the innovation that's happening in Pakistan. And honestly, I go mad with pride. I just go mad with pride. So it's uh, it's so inspiring for me to to be part of this conversation, to know you guys, like the kind of conversations and and questions that you are asking. And uh, and I think the one thing that Harun said earlier about like, oh, my prayer, you know, my relationship with my prayer. Like I think the only thing is if we could if if we could get outside of our systems to look at ourselves as Pakistanis with new eyes, everything, if we can find a way to look at our janamas with new eyes, what we do with appreciation and love, it would be a good idea to, you know, have a source of pride. Great, thank you, that's very well said. <laughs> um, so thank you thank you everyone for joining us and on that note um, we're going to sign off for tonight and we hope to see you folks soon with another speaker have a great rest of the evening bye everyone thank you, thank you Asma thank you. thank you so much Asma thank you so much have oh it was my pleasure can you all stay for a second I just want to take a really quick picture of all of us here through my computer. Whoops. Okay, that didn't happen. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Bye. Take care. Take care.